Hey everyone, my name is Corel, and today we're going to be taking a look at a new From the Depths tutorial, this time about Defense in Depth. Defense in Depth is kind of an interesting concept. It basically it just means the sum total of all of your defenses kind of packed together and understanding uh, what types of incoming fire you're going to take, uh, what types of damage you're going to take, and how to defend yourself against that as a whole rather than just looking at individual components. We'll look at individual components as a part of this, of course, but uh, overall we're just trying to defend a vehicle as best we can given the tools that we have in From the Depths. Now, uh, this is a particularly difficult topic because there is no such thing as a perfect defense. No matter how well you armor your vehicle, no matter how well you have your active defenses set up, no matter how well you evade, something is going to hit you eventually, it's going to deal more damage than you can take, and it's probably going to kill you. So uh, there's only so much you can do to defend yourself, especially against some of the instant hit weapons like lasers and particle cannons. Uh, that being said, there are things you can do to defend yourself even against those, so we're just going to start walking through this and uh, take a look at as many of these possible defensive concepts as we can. So in order to start with this uh, particular topic, I've got this lovely little vehicle here called the Vargeist. Now this is something that I just put together over the last few days, and it is reasonably well defended right off the bat. So this has uh, very heavy armor on it. Uh, it's got a four layer thick of alloy, metal, applique, and stone uh, everywhere around the sides. The top level, or the top layer is um, just alloy, metal, and applique, uh, with no stone in there. But And the bottom is just uh, light alloy and metal. Uh, I believe there's, let's see, yeah, there is a layer of stone in there as well. So uh, three layer thick armor, minimum all the way around. Uh, the turret up here is defended by multiple layers of metal with heavy armor reinforcement around critical points just because you can't really fit uh, that much armor in this tight of a space. Uh, this turret does not descend below decks, it is all on top, so uh, space is somewhat limited here, especially for containing the guns and various other things that we're going to add here. But before we get going too much on the actual practical application of defense in depth, we're going to talk about the major categories of defense, uh, or rather the major categories of attack even before that. So there are four different real main attack categories. There's projectiles, those are your APS, your cram, your simple cannons, your missiles, uh, things that are going to fly at you and hit you. You've also got guided. Uh, those, those, these are usually missile-based things. They're uh, things that are going to home in on your vehicle. You've got laser, which is uh, instant hit. There's really no uh, fooling it or deflecting it. Uh, your best bet is just to be able to withstand the laser. And you've got particle cannons, which I put into their own category separate from laser because the rules for them are slightly different. There are some defenses against lasers. There really aren't any defenses against particle cannons except range, but we'll get into that later. So getting into our major defense categories, uh, the first topic that we want to talk about is range. Now, uh, range is probably the most universal defense. Uh, any given weapon type that you look at is going to be weak against some sort of range. Uh, if you're talking about, say, APS cannons on turrets, those have a weakness against very close range things. Uh, if you're talking about, say, missiles, uh, those are very weak against things at extreme ranges, unless you put a lot of fuel tanks on there, in which case the missile's not as good against close-in things. Uh, missiles also have a minimum range to them. Uh, if, if you try and hit something that's too close, Generally, you're not going to get a missile to explode on it, simply because the missile is going to try and turn uh, to, to hit the target and probably fail if it's too close. So, uh, yeah, missiles have a definitive range gate up close and another one at whatever the maximum range of the missile is. Uh, small missiles also don't have a huge maximum range, simply because they've only got 10 seconds of flight time. So you can't really use them like an artillery missile to strike something three kilometers away, because even at max thrust, they just don't have time to get there. Range also has interactions with a bunch of other different defense categories. Uh, every defense category that we're going to talk about in the future is in some way beneficially affected by having long range. 
But keep in mind, range is a two-way street here. Uh, you're not just getting extra defense by being at long range, you're also losing uh, your weapon's effectiveness. Simultaneously, your opponent's countermeasures are going to be more effective. So, while yes, you can engage very effectively from extreme ranges, say three kilometers out, uh, you can get cannons to work at that range, you can get medium and large missiles to work at that range with uh, the correct setup, but generally speaking, uh, a ship that's sitting three kilometers away from its target is not going to be able to effectively engage simply because there aren't a whole lot of weapons that are going to deal reliable damage at that range. So uh, range is kind of a double-edged sword and very useful when you're talking about uh, all of your other defense mechanisms. Uh, tune your defense mechanisms for your desired engagement range and tune your vehicle's uh, movement capabilities to try and get you to that range and keep you there. If you can dictate the range of the engagement, you can get your weapons to work and you can keep your enemy's weapons from working. The first uh, major defense category that we can start talking about active defenses in is uh, counter detection. Counter detection is basically trying to minimize the detection profile of your vehicle while simultaneously maximizing the detection profile of something that is not your vehicle. Uh, so <laughs> if it makes sense, um, there are a couple of ways of doing this. One is trying to spoof a uh, target prioritization card. Nearly every vehicle will have a target prioritization card on it, and this one's no exception. If we dig in here into the AI components, uh, we will be able to find that and take a look. And we have a target prioritization algorithm. So this is the default settings right here. I have not actually uh, prioritized any given targets with this, but uh, basically targets with a lot of weapons on them. You can see this uh, 10 per weapon here. Uh, tend to get prioritized very highly. Targets that are very fast tend to get prioritized highly. And targets that have a lot of crew or uh, AI blocks or players on them uh, also get prioritized, again, very highly. Um, range, altitude, uh, range plays a negative factor, so closer targets get less, or get more priority, I should say, and further targets get less priority. Uh, and targets that are high in the air get more priority. Targets with engines, propulsion, and large mass get some priority assigned as well. Uh, that's just with the default settings. Obviously, those can be tuned however you want per vehicle. Uh, but what you end up with there um, is you can set up decoy vehicles. And decoy vehicles basically let you uh, spam like simple weapons or very cheap weaponry uh, so that you can trick that you know value per weapon on say a um, target prioritization card and that lets you dictate uh, what an opponent's target will likely be. Then you can throw all sorts of armor and defensive mechanisms and all sorts of crazy stuff on the uh, uh, decoy vehicle and it can be what things shoot at instead of you know your actual main combat force. So that's something of what counter detection is. Um, at least that's what it would look like for this specific vehicle. This specific vehicle has two cannon controllers and four missile controllers right now, and those are its only weaponry. Those are really the only thing going on with this vehicle that will trigger that 20 per weapon uh, stat in the target prioritization card. So, you know, it, you, it wouldn't be very difficult to put, say, 30 simple weapons on a giant chunk of armor somewhere and have that be prioritized fairly heavily over this. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, and it will help, even if the vehicles are detected equally, it will help you uh, kind of decoy fire away from the things that are going to be doing the really hard hitting, if that makes sense. Uh, anyway, enough about that. Another topic of counter detection is simply not being detected. And this is basically impossible in From the Depths. Things are going to detect you. However, there are things you can do to minimize that detection, and that's still a valuable exercise uh, because even though you are going to get detected, that doesn't mean that your enemies are going to be able to get a good detection fix on you. So uh, having a lot of angular light alloy like this on the outside of the vehicle, the entire exterior of this, aside from the turret, is light alloy. 
uh, all of this light alloy has a very low radar return, uh, relative to its size anyway. So while yes, radar is going to get a lock on this vehicle, it might have trouble pinning down the exact position. Now the vehicle's size also plays into that and generally makes it impossible for us to consider this a stealthy vehicle. So just with the size and shape of this thing, I know that's not really a valid def uh, defensive mechanism for this. However, if you were to try and use uh, more defenses against uh, detection, uh, there's a number of things that you can do in order to minimize your radar return. Uh, use flat angular surfaces on the surface of your vehicle. Use materials like light alloy on the outside of the vehicle. Minimize the number of external components that are on the outside of the vehicle. And things like that will give you a very low radar return. Uh, likewise, having small vehicles uh, will make visual detection uh, very difficult. So things like this uh, camera gimbal tracker that I've got up here on the turret uh, will not be able to get an effective lock on you if your vehicle is so small that they can't see you. Uh, likewise, uh, these cameras are affected by day and night cycles. So you can, you know, attack at night if you want to be particularly stealthy. Again, keep in mind this is a double-edged sword. Nighttime also makes your detection work less effectively, at least in terms of the visual detection method. Um, infrared, on the other hand, not affected by night whatsoever. It looks for hot targets. And this particular target is not very hot, uh, mostly just due to its profile here. The only thing on this vehicle that produces heat, it is entirely powered by Deta blades or dedicated helicopter blades. The only thing in here that produces heat is the two engine exhaust ports on the bottom. And these are very intentionally placed on the bottom so that the bottom is where the infrared signature is the largest. Now this vehicle flies very close to the ocean, and actually in combat it flies even lower. Uh, it dips down to where the bottom of this uh, uh, metal is almost touching the ocean. And that means that there's probably not a whole lot of infrared missiles coming up from beneath it. Uh, which makes infrared missiles and uh, detectors very unlikely to be effective against it. So uh, that's one way of minimizing that particular type of detection. Uh, every type of detection has a weakness, it's just a matter of finding that weakness and exploiting it as much as you possibly can. The next defensive topic is evasion. And quite simply, evasion is multiplied in effectiveness with range. Uh, it's not really effective all that much against most missiles. Most missiles are going to have some sort of guidance package on them that's going to defeat evasion but it's very effective against all projectile types. Uh, again, with lasers and pack, those are instant hit. You're not going to do anything against those. This is purely a projectile defense. But cram cannons are entirely negated by any reasonable amount of evasion, uh, especially when coupled with range. So at about a kilometer out, any reasonable amount of evasive movement is going to make the vast majority of cram cannon shots simply miss you. Now, advanced cannon shells are a lot trickier because those can be rail-assisted, they could uh, be kinetic shells with a very fast uh, projectile speed. Those can get up to do, uh, over a kilometer per second in some extreme cases, so really there's no, not, not really a whole lot of evading those. You're going to get hit by those most likely. But the slower ones, like the high-explosive shells, those you can probably avoid. High explosive shells tend to not have nearly as high of projectile speed simply because they tend to not rely on gunpowder in order to increase their kinetic damage. So uh, all those can be rail assisted in large cannons. Generally speaking, uh, the high explosive shells, not something that you're going to see traveling at one kilometer a second. So you can evade those. Couple that with about a kilometer distance, you might have about three seconds to change your direction of movement. Evasion is all about direction of movement. It's not necessarily about how fast you're going, it's about changing what direction you're going constantly. The From the Depths uh, targeting uh, algorithms basically try and predict where your vehicle will be based on where it currently is and what speed you're traveling. So if I am in position A traveling one meter per second forwards and uh, something needs to target me in five seconds, it's going to know to fire five meters ahead of my current position. But if the vehicle is changing its velocity, say it's at one meter per second traveling forwards 
and changing negative one meter per second per second, then the vehicle will actually end up behind its current position at the end of five seconds, and the uh, shot targeted five meters in front of me will probably miss. So uh, you can use uh, modifications to your speed, just changing your speed and direction of travel constantly in order to avoid a lot of projectiles. Again, it's not a perfect defense, but defense in depth is all about a lot of imperfect defenses coming together to form something that's actually pretty competent. So uh, that's a, the start of another defensive topic. The next topic up is countermeasures. Countermeasures are specifically designed to defeat guided uh, attacks. So anything that's involving a missile at this current point is really the only thing that uh, this will help to counter. Now, uh, countermeasures are uh, very effective against missiles in bulk. Uh, missiles can uh, expend a component in order to make the countermeasures considerably less effective. And uh, some vehicles will do that, but a lot of them won't. So countermeasures are kind of your anti-bulk simple missile strategy. Uh, they will effectively decoy vast numbers of missiles, leaving you getting hit by one or two instead of 50 out of a swarm of 50. So uh, they are very effective. These are, there's a, actually a wide variety of them. Uh, they both involve blocks that you can place on your vehicle uh, there are heat decoys and radar decoys that you can place on your vehicle and uh, position in places that are very heavily armored or very unlikely for the vehicle to take secondary hits from. Uh, so, for instance, I could put one on a stick on the side of this vehicle facing out this way, and uh, it would be very unlikely for something to hit that and then continue on to hit the body of the vehicle. So, um, basically, the, you're trying to countermeasure the missiles into hitting things that are not critical and not going to deal a lot of damage to you. Uh, that is a very effective way of dealing with missiles, but it's not the only countermeasure available. Missiles themselves can also have countermeasures on them. So you've got flare decoys, you've got radar decoys, you've got sonar decoys. All of those are going to draw a substantial number of enemy missiles off course. So that's what a countermeasure does. Uh, you've also got LAMs. LAMS is laser anti-munition systems, and those are designed to defeat both projectiles and guided attacks, so both your cannon shells and your missiles. Uh, generally speaking, the types of uh, LAMS that are good against one are not ideal for the other, so sometimes it's to your advantage to have a couple different types of LAMS on a vehicle, if you can spare the power and the uh, space to do so. This particular vehicle is a little cramped on space. Uh, while it's very large, a very substantial portion of its size is consumed by armor. So uh, that's not really something we have a whole lot of play in here, but we can at least put in simple lambs on this vehicle and we will do so later. So uh, the next topic up is close in weapons systems. Um, these are cannons designed to destroy missiles. Uh, they can also be set up to fire at target vehicles, which is quite useful really, but uh, generally speaking they are firing flak shells which aren't going to do a lot of damage to other vehicles. However, they will take down swarms of missiles pretty effectively, especially if they have a relatively quick fire rate. So uh, they're generally used to defeat missiles that are volley fired as opposed to, uh, or rather burst fired as opposed to using a staggered fire add-on. So in, in this case, if I was to fire all of these missiles at once, a single flak shell could probably take out all of them at once. So uh, they would be clustered all together. A flak shell's got a nice big explosive radius, and it's going to blow up in the middle of those if it's aimed correctly, and hopefully blow up the entire set of them. If I have a staggered fire add-on, which I do on this particular setup, then they will come in kind of time delayed and that flak shell might, that same single flak shell might take out, oh, say a quarter of them, but it's not going to take out the whole swarm. However, lambs are more effective when talking about the swarms of missiles. It has more time to deal with each individual missile if they're not all hitting at once. So you've got kind of a counterplay there. Uh, your close-in weapon systems or your anti-missile cannons can deal with those bulk missiles 
whereas your lambs are better at dealing with a stream of them. The next defensive mechanism is shields. Shields are simply uh, a defense against projectiles. Now, this is a little bit of a misnomer because you can have projectiles that are spawned from a missile, and shields will protect against those. If you have a frag missile, those are going to spawn a lot of particles, and shields will reflect those particles, or at least some of them. Right now, in the current build of the game, you can only actually reflect, say, about 30% of incoming fire, give or take. And that's about as good as you're going to get with a normal shield panel. There's another type of shield called a ring shield that simply adds armor class to the sides of your vehicle. And to my mind, that's probably more valuable. Uh, the outside of your vehicle is a nebulous thing. Because if I was to break a bunch of armor on the front of the vehicle out here, well, that's no longer on the front of my vehicle, therefore the front of my vehicle is the armor layer behind that. So uh, as you use those ring shields, they're progressively boosting the armor class of every layer of armor front to back as they're destroyed. And that can be very powerful when it's all added up together. Uh, it's a very useful damage mitigation technique. However, it's not going to deflect any significant proportion of uh, actual shells like a deflection shield would, or a reflect shield would. And so, yeah, you can't use both together, so it's a little bit nebulous as to which one you should use in which scenario. Uh, that is mostly a decision you're going to have to make on a per-vehicle basis. There's a specific type of shield that can also be used to reduce the power of laser beams, uh, that is a laser reflect shield, or a, rather a laser absorption shield, and it will reduce the amount of damage that a laser can do to you. But by and far, the only real defensive mechanism against lasers is smoke. Now, smoke has two different things that you can do with that. You can cause smoke to be emitted from a cannon. So you can put a big, a large gauge cannon, um, and you can have a smoke shell on that and have it timed to detonate in front of your vehicle. Any lasers passing through that smoke will have their damage reduced. Likewise, you can have smoke emitters on the vehicle itself and laser detectors, and when those detect that you're getting hit by lasers, it can release smoke on various different points of the vehicle. Uh, smoke does have a limited radius, so it's not a uh, perfect defense. On a vehicle this size, I would need smoke emitters probably in the front two quadrants and the back two quadrants in order to be able to form a reasonably effective smoke defense. Uh, if I didn't have smoke emitters in all of those locations, odds are I would not be able to completely shroud this vehicle in smoke, which means that lasers coming from different angles would probably get right through it. In the last video, we actually talked about armor as a defensive mechanism, so I'm not going to cover that again here, but it is the only defensive mechanism that is a hard counter to everything. It, at hard being a little bit of a pun there, but uh, in, in any case, armor is the last resort. It's what's going to take the damage for you. You are going to get hit. You need armor in order to resist those hits. Armor is going to get broken, and components are going to get broken behind that armor, so what you need on top of armor is redundancy. Redundancy is the next uh, kind of layer of defense. Things are going to get shot, they are going to break down, they are going to get destroyed, but if you have redundant things on your vehicle, that's not always the end of the world. Taking this vehicle as an example, we have eight rotors on it uh, for lift. We have two in the back, we've got two on each of these sides, and we have two in the front. Those rotors are uh, actually doubled top and bottom. There's a layer of heavy armor beneath, or between the rotors. So you can't simply shoot out the top rotor and expect the bottom one to die as well. So it's really quite difficult to destroy this vehicle's lift. Uh, you'd be likely to actually get the thing down to 55% health and cause it to despawn before it actually loses its lift. Likewise, you can actually chop off the front third of this vehicle, and the back third, two-thirds, will continue to fly happily. Uh, it has enough control authority and spare lift on these back rotors to more than fly itself, if, even if the entire front of the vehicle gets destroyed. Likewise, these turning thrusters here are also used for strafe, but there are two on each side in both the front and the back. So again, you're very unlikely, to, while you might destroy one of the set of these, 
you're very unlikely to destroy both sets of them on a side or enough of them to actually be able to stop the vehicle from being able to strafe and move. The only single point of thrust failure on this vehicle is this rear rotor. Uh, basically, if this goes, you have no range control. Uh, and that's kind of the weak spot of the vehicle, but it's still ve very heavily encased in armor, top, bottom, left, and right. Plus, it's in a location that's extremely like, unlikely to get hit. Uh, if you're shooting this thing, uh, this uh, vehicle is set up with a point at AI, so it's going to be going to try and point at you at all times. Moreover, it's set to maintain about a kilometer of distance. So if you are about a kilometer away from this thing, all you're going to see of it is the front. And if all you're seeing is the front, then you're going to have a very hard time shooting anything but the front armor and the turret. The turret, again, is extremely heavily armored. These missile racks are less heavily armored, but they're still quite durable. So generally speaking, you're not going to be able to hit that until you've already broken everything else. The only exception to that is a an orbiting vehicle that gets very, very close. Uh, some of the white flare vehicles specifically would probably give this thing fits, simply because it does not have enough turn rate in order to be able to deal with them. Finally, your absolute last resort in terms of defense is repairs. Repairs are quite simply fixing stuff that gets broke. Uh, you can talk about redundancy all you want, eventually stuff's going to break that's going to cause your vehicle to fail. And you probably don't want that, you probably want your vehicle to continue working. So yes, while the redundancy will help with that, you're still going to take critical damage eventually unless you repair your vehicle. You can do in-combat repairs with either repair tentacles uh, with a nearby vehicle or with these repair bots. This particular vehicle, I've slotted repair bots in these little nooks in the side, both on the front and back. And again, that's four different locations with a significant number of repair bots each. It's very unlikely that all of these are going to get destroyed by any given target. So generally speaking, we're fairly well defended in that regard already. I'm not going to talk more about repairs, uh, gener but generally speaking, you want your repair bots spread out across the surface of your vehicle in multiple locations so they have redundancy and uh, can't all be destroyed in one shot. Uh, that gives you a pretty like a uh, pretty good chance of success in repairing your vehicle both after combat is over as well as getting some repairs done during combat itself. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is get into some practical examples. This particular vehicle is set up with a very basic AI. If I look at the behavior on this, it's got to point at and maintain distance. I haven't added any evasion or anything else to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to spawn in a uh, uh, probably the Eerie from the Onyx watch, because that has a lot of cram cannons on it, and we're just going to see how this behaves against that. Alright, so uh, another thing that I've done here is uh, I tuned the PIDs a little bit. The things wobbling back and forth was uh, honestly kind of driving me nuts. So, uh, yeah, having improved the PIDs, it's a little bit more stable now. Uh, so we're going to spawn in an Eerie, and we're just going to see how this performs. So there's our Eerie. And you can see we're dealing quite a bit of damage to it. That's all well and good. These cram shells, uh, looks like we got a hit in there. So we just took a bunch of damage on the front corner. And uh, just in the interests of, yeah, I'm on the ocean floor. That's good. So uh, we're just going to follow this for a minute here. You can see that we're sliding to the right, but we're not really changing our direction of movement. So we just got pegged by another cram shell. And even though it's a little hard to see through the smoke, that took a chunk out of the turret. We're also getting hit by some frag shells. These cram shells are coming very, very close to hitting in every case. Uh, in fact, it looks like we're probably going to get hit by that one. Yep. Uh, these are, again, pretty accurate. Got hit again there. Took a few more there. Uh, those just barely missed. Looks like we're going to take another couple hits here. So you can see the Eerie is able to hit us fairly reliably, and in fact it's doing a fair amount of damage to our cannon. So uh, in fact it looks like it disabled one side of our cannon over here. So what we're going to do is reset this here, and uh, we're going to try this with some evasion. Alright, so what we're going to do here is go into the mainframe. We're going to head into the Behaviors tab, 
and we're just going to check the left and right evasion time. This vehicle is really bulky and doesn't have a lot of strafe power, so we're going to set this to about 4 seconds of left evasion and 6 of right. That'll give it a generally right direction that it will end up traveling in, so it'll end up circling an opponent over time. That's probably about what we want. Uh, it means that we'll end up circling around vehicles that are uh, maybe not designed to deal with that. Uh, circling is a pretty effective technique in terms of making sure that you are hitting an opponent's surface all the way around and that you're stripping off a lot of critical components. You might also be able to duck into a blind spot where an enemy doesn't have proper detection set up. So yeah, generally speaking, uh, being able to kind of strafe around an opponent is a pretty good defensive mechanism. So with just those two tweaks, we're going to spawn in another Eerie here, and we're going to see what happens. So again, we have the Eerie over there, exactly the same position. First cannon shells miss, as we'd expect. And we're just going to see what it does with these next cram shells. So the next couple miss. We've got a couple more coming in over here that are aimed kind of where we're expecting to be or where we're expected to be, but we're not quite there. You can see these uh, frag shells, these light frag shells that the Eerie fires are still uh, going to hit us because they're quite quick, but we kind of paused in our right movement there, and that made a bunch of those cram shells miss. And then we resumed and it made more cram shells miss. We did take one hit there, but the rest of that volley missed. Likewise here, we're going to generally get missed by the vast majority of these simply because we do not have a very predictable path of movement. We're still going to get attacked, we're still going to take damage, but overall, much fewer of these shells are going to land, and when they do land, they're not hitting as critical of things, uh, because they're not hitting what the shells were originally aimed at. Uh, so, yeah, this is rather effective, but not perfect. Also worth noting that with that simple change to the AI, we go from being pretty well destroyed by an Eerie to actually defeating the Eerie. This thing is now in the water, it's not going to be able to reliably hit us at all, and this, uh, the Bargeist over here, is not in great shape, but it's still firing, it's still got its missiles, it's still got its cannons. All of its weapons are still functional, its thrust is still functional, and its armor is more or less intact. So we have weathered the storm, and this Eerie will eventually get destroyed. The next thing we're going to add to this is a Deflection Lambs. Uh, deflection Lambs is really only effective against infrared missiles, but it's extremely effective against infrared missiles. So it, it's something worth investing in, even if it's not the most powerful thing in the world. Now, the only real space where there's, well, the only place there's any real free space on this vehicle is in the turret, unfortunately. Uh, there is a little bit of free space up here. There's also a little bit in the center of the vehicle. Uh, I've got a command and control area in here, and then you've got a uh, small area in here that we're going to use for some other defensive mechanisms later. But really, this vehicle, other than that, is entirely packed with blocks. There's just no space here. So uh, what we're going to do is add a simple laser system up here, and for this, this is just a deflection lambs. We went over this in the laser tutorial. Uh, really all there is to it is we're just going to go to the laser systems here. And we're going to start off with a multi-purpose laser block. And what we're going to do is just stick one of these in. And in fact, I'm going to stick this in one block down so that we can uh, use transceivers to move laser around a little easier. And what we're going to do is stick a single laser coupler in here with a single cavity and a single uh, laser pump attached to that. Uh, don't want any Q switches on the cavity. Well, everything else here is pretty much good to go. And now we just need to actually get these lasers out to where they can do something. So I'm going to pop this guy here and these transceivers will send a laser beam out this direction. So we still need to do something out here in order to actually, you know, be able to shoot the lasers. So uh, we'll attach some laser nodes out here. I'll wire those up with transceivers. I, we can do that off camera so uh, we're not wasting your time. And we'll just see what we come up with. All right, so I've hooked the deflection lambs up 
and it is just pointing to all of these different lambs nodes scattered around the turret. I haven't actually put anything on the base of the vehicle, it's just on the turret. So uh, the deflection lambs itself is from our laser tutorial. This is a, an extremely basic laser that doesn't have enough power to actually shoot anything down. It's really just there to confuse the uh, guidance systems on uh, infrared missiles. Uh, to that end, these LAMS nodes are set to engage. In fact, we're going to change how these engage. Um, you know, we're actually not going to change how these are going to engage, and that's because we're going to add a damaged LAMS on top of this in a moment. But uh, the, overall, if this was just for a deflection LAMS, we'd want to uh, target all projectile types, we'd want to change that to target missiles only, and we'd want to be a little more restrictive about you know how we're dealing with this. Uh, we also want to fire all of our lambs within smoke. We're going to be putting smoke on this vehicle to deal with enemy lasers, and we want to be able to kind of stop missiles even if the smoke's in the way. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we want to be able to fire within smoke, even though the damage will get reduced from the eventual damaging lambs that we're going to put on this. Uh, let's also go ahead and use white lasers, because I like the look of that. Uh, and we'll just copy that to everywhere on the vehicle. And all of these other LAMS nodes will have gotten that now as well. Now, I've loaded in the Vargeist. I've loaded in a, an infrared missile drone. And you can see here that it's having a little bit of trouble hitting us. These uh, LAMS nodes are continuously deflecting that missile. Uh, and this is honestly what we want. It's pretty good. For the low amount of resources that we expended in that particular system, especially since we're going to be reusing those components for the damage lambs, this thing is pretty hard to hit for an inf infrared missile. That's also helped by the fact that we have a low heat signature, so infrared missiles just aren't going to lock on all that well. Alright, so let's go ahead and add in a uh, damaging lambs, and we'll see how that does against radar guided missiles. Alright, so I've made a few modifications to this turret. We now have a damage uh, laser in here, and we've been packed in a lot of storage components, which are usually pretty effective for a uh, LAMS-type missile, or anti-missile system. Uh, so we've got a moderately effective laser here. Uh, you can see if we fire, if we see a missile nearby, if we ever get a missile nearby, this thing will be able to shoot it down fairly effectively. So let's go ahead and load in a radar version of this same drone. And we'll see this fire, and we'll see how effective this lambs is at shooting it down. Now you can see we shot down all three of those missiles. So that's great for low volumes of missiles and for the occasional cannon shell. But for large volumes of missiles, we're still going to slip them through. If I was to load in several of these radar drones, uh, you would begin to see them slip their missiles past the lambs fairly quickly, simply because it would not have the damage to destroy them. So let's load in a few more of these drones. And you can see we've got a few different volleys headed in here. And you can see those are starting to slip past. And yeah, those that's not what we want. We want those missiles to stop before they get to us. There's a couple different methods we can use to defeat that. But for now, suffice it to say, we're not going to stop all those radar-guided missiles. So we might as well not try. Uh, one of the reasons that you want a LAMS to fire at long distance is to stop missiles. But we're not going to be relying on this for stopping missiles entirely, at least, so let's reduce the range, uh, especially since we're trying to stop them in one shot, ideally. Uh, normally, if we were trying to stop things and we needed to fire a lot at it before it would get to us, we'd uh, keep that range pretty high. But LAMS, uh, uh, these specific laser nodes, lose a lot of their effectiveness at long ranges. So we're just going to drop that to 100 meters. We're going to copy that to everything here. And these lasers are not going to engage anything that comes in uh, that isn't closer than 100 meters. Or farther than 100 meters, I should say. So you can still see we're still taking hits from these radar missiles. And really, that's not going to stop. The LAMS just isn't going to cut it for this. So in order to deal with these missiles, we're going to need some additional volume. Uh, we're going to use a missile-based countermeasure system to decoy enemy missiles and hopefully destroy them as well. So in order to do that, we just need some additional space to work with. This vehicle does not have enough internal volume to spare. 
we're going to create some by uh, creating a bulge in this armor back here and tuck these right in next to the uh, rear thrust. So we'll get, be back in a minute and I'll have added some missiles in. Alright, so I've added a few uh, decoy missiles, a combination decoy interceptor missiles using the new cluster missile system, and these seem to be pretty effective. Uh, these are basically a medium missile being launched with a flare and enough radar decoys to uh, draw enemy missiles to them. They also have a cluster missile ejector with a bunch of small missiles and a missile interceptor head on them themselves. So you get, in effect, a uh, very powerful decoy missile uh, with a bunch of smaller missiles launching from it. And while not perfect, we can launch one of these every five seconds and maintain that indefinitely. And yeah, it's not a bad system overall. It, it seems to stop the vast majority of incoming fire, uh, or decoy the vast majority of it at the very least. So uh, while not perfect, again, this is another layer of our defense. Another common missile defense is to simply add some anti-missile cannons. And this is uh, generally fairly effective. Uh, there's a number of different ways you can go about this. You can build advanced cannons with flak. Uh, personally, one of my favorite methods is to use these casemated guns. These are surprisingly effective flak cannons. Uh, they're not, they don't have the fastest fire rate, so you want to back them up with other defensive mechanisms, but they're only 3,500 materials apiece, which is generally cheaper than you're going to get an equivalent uh, firepower of advanced cannon. Moreover, they can actually fit uh, custom shells. So you can put in whatever custom shell design you want into these, and that means we can build ourselves a nice little flak shell. I'm going to go ahead and do that here and mount that on the sides of this vehicle. All right, so I've gone ahead and added a couple of casemated guns, one on each side of this vehicle, just to act as anti-missile cannons. Now, these aren't anything particularly special. They're simple weapons. They're using a pure flak shell. Uh, with a timed fuse on it, so they should be able to explode on missiles directly. And that's really all there is to it. These are just kind of embedded into the side of the vehicle here. Uh, I even stuck a uh, local weapon controller on these. So if you really want to, you can have these shoot uh, light aircraft out of the sky, but their reload time is fairly long, so probably best not to use it for that in most cases. Uh, so I've got this thing ready to go here. What I'm going to do is spawn in a nest of bees, that is a twin guard vehicle, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause here, and let's just go over to the twin guard, and spawn in the nest of bees, and where did that put it? Uh, it does not look like it spawned in yet. Anywhere? There it is. Okay, so we've got the nest of bees, which is a, uh, a lot of missiles. This thing fires a lot of missiles. And we're just going to see uh, exactly what we can do to stop this. Our vehicle is going to go ahead and fire back. We are going to win this fight handily. Uh, even if we didn't have the anti-missile systems, we would probably still win. But with them in place, we should win quite easily. So let's go ahead and uh, get this unpaused, and we'll see what happens. So you can see the swarm of missiles is coming in. We've got a decoy going up. A lot of those missiles are going after the decoy. A lot of them are getting shot down by the interceptors. Not all of them, though. But we fire another decoy. More missiles go after it. We are taking some hits. Our armor is holding up against all of these hits. Uh, we are getting some EMP damage. Those are going through and uh, hitting surge protectors that are embedded in short circuits in the armor, as we discussed in the last armoring tutorial. And most of these missiles are just getting decoyed. Some are getting shot down, some are getting decoyed, some are getting intercepted with the interceptors. And in the meantime, we're sitting here firing back. And this thing doesn't much like the return fire. And there we go, there's the two damaged, and it's despawning. So taking a look at our vehicle back here, we took some damage. You can see the repair bots are out and doing their thing. Uh, they're getting repaired up and we're back to 100%. So that was a very successful fight, uh, despite the fact that the target was using a ton of missiles. Now, if we're to fight something like the on Onyx Watch uh, Eerie again, uh, you'll note that it does not really have any missiles for us to shoot down. However, the LAM system that we added is still useful. And in this case, we're still firing those flak shells at the Eerie. That's useful. 
Uh, we're still dealing a little bit of damage with these things, even though there are no missiles to shoot down. Moreover, we're able to shoot down some of these cram shells that are more likely to hit us. Uh, remember how we got hit with a few cram shells? Well, that's pretty much at an end. Uh, the few cram shells that would be able to get close enough to hit us probably aren't going to be able to hit us anymore. They're probably going to get shot down. And the return fire back here is devastatingly effective against the Eerie. It just does not have enough defenses to deal with this. So, uh, looks like we did take a hit there. In fact, took two hits there. But these are all armor blocks that are coming off of here. Nothing critical. A minute or so later here, we've disabled the Eerie. It's got some return fire off. It's managed to land another shell or two. But it basically did nothing, and we are pretty much completely repaired and back up to full health. So that was a very successful fight, and we are now pretty well defended against this type of target. The only remaining type of thing that we need to defend against, that we can defend against, is lasers. Laser defense is pretty easy. First off, you'd get these uh, warners here. I've already got a couple in place. We can go ahead and add a couple more. They're very easy to place. You pretty much just attach um, another AI component out here. Uh, let's see, these AI physical connectors. And you take a uh, laser warner. These are in countermeasures, I believe. Yes, laser warners here. And you plop one in. And that's, that's pretty much that. Now, they do need view to the outside of the vehicle, so right here is actually not a good spot because it's being blocked by that area out there. And that's, yeah, we need to find a better spot for it. Uh, we can probably pack one in on the turret somewhere, and that will probably be our best bet. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we have, back here in the back, this little anti-munition defense node. I would bet that if we were to take a look in here... Yeah, this looks like a good location for it. Uh, we could just stick a laser warner up here. Now, you do probably want to space these out across the hole. Uh, they do have a limited range, so you want to make sure that they're kind of spread out uh, within about 25 blocks of each other. Uh, so we could do some uh, weird stuff and stick one like right here and all over various different parts of the ship. Uh, for now, I'm going to forgo all of that just for the sake of time and show you what the other part that you need to do is. Uh, once you have the warning, you need to actually be able to do something about it. So in order to do that, you need AI components here. You need an AI connected to your mainframe, as those laser warners are connected to your mainframe. And then you basically just need to come in here and pick up in the countermeasure section uh, these um, yeah, where they are, smoke dispensers. You put these in your vehicle. And that's pretty much that. They reduce laser armor piercing very significantly, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, this will uh, emit smoke from the location here, and that smoke has a limited size. So uh, you can dictate how much fuel these will use per second. These things do use fuel. And you can trigger how long uh, a laser warner or ACB will uh, cause smoke to show up for when it receives a warning. Uh, you can also say don't deploy the uh, smoke if you're below a certain percentage of fuel, if you want to go that route. So that's all well and good, and we now have smoke. Even if it is not exactly in the best place, it is at least on the front of the vehicle, which is more or less where we would want it for this particular case. Uh, another thing I'm going to do here real quick is go ahead and throw in a ring shield. I don't have any shields on this thing at all currently. Uh, let's see, ring shields are right here, and we're just going to throw together a very basic set of ring shields. Uh, again, these aren't going to be doing much at all, but they are doing something, and that's worth something to us. So we're just going to pick up another ring corner here. And in fact, let's go ahead and put this all the way out to the edge. We stick some ring pipes in. Stick some marine corners in. And we can do a little bit of fancying up here if we want to. Keep in mind that the more corners that you put into a ring shield, the more likely that uh, when a ring shield gets broken, the vehicle is going to be irreparably damaged. 
these things store a nearly infinite amount of energy, and uh, they'll just keep building up energy over and over and over again. When any segment of this actually gets broken while the shield is active, it will uh, basically fire a beam dealing that much damage, and it, it stacks up basically infinitely, so you're going to be dealing rather a lot of damage. Not something you necessarily want happening to your vehicle. But uh, in our case, we're not too worried about that. This particular area of the vehicle is extremely heavily armored. These ring shields are very unlikely to get broken. And you can see here, this particular ring shield is giving us an extra 3.1 armor class. It's not a ton, but it does mean that your uh, whatever is hitting you needs an extra 6.2 armor piercing in order to actually deal full damage to you. Uh, that will also re further reduce the damage of anything that doesn't have enough armor pierce, so it's worth doing. Uh, next, we're just going to add a couple more ring shields here, and we're going to add these on the sides. Uh, we're, let's go ahead and put these right here. This looks like a good spot for them. And again, we're just going to make these ring pipes and stick some ring corners in. More ring pipe. Looks like we need another corner here. And one straight pipe and another corner. Another corner here. A couple of straight pipes, more corners. Basically, I'm uh, doing all of this cornering just to maximize the amount of volume that I can fit inside the ring. The larger the unoccupied spaces within each of these rings, the more armor class I get out of the shield. So you can see uh, we now have uh, right, left, no shielding. Ring form, but its area is zero. Ah, it helps if you place the generators with the open area facing towards the ring. So now you can see we have a uh, right, left total of 3.7 armor class, which is not amazing, but it's respectable. So again, what we can do here is add more ring shield generators. We're just going to add another pair of these. In fact, why don't we add three of these because four back is rather important to us. So we're just going to add more ring pipes to this. We're going to add some corners. Add more ring pipes. Again, we want to keep as much area enclosed within this as possible, and we don't have a lot of room to work with due to the vehicle's tight quarters. So we're going to pop those in there. These two can get an extra block or two of space if we go up a little bit. But this one down here pretty much just has to go straight across. So we will go across there. And then we'll complete those two. And we have three ring shields here, giving us a total ring strength of 4.3 armor class in the front back direction. Now that doesn't seem like a ton but it does bring our armor class up on the front to a fairly respectable amount of 17.3. Our light alloy out here is actually stronger than metal, even ignoring the metal backing to that light alloy. So that's uh, your basics of defense. Uh, really, that's all there is to it. Uh, we've got shielding, we've got countermeasures for missiles and uh, cannon shells, we've got smoke for our lasers, we've got decoys, uh, you can do some funny stuff with these sensor scramblers if you want to. Uh, you can use up some engine and processing power in order, order to basically scramble enemy electronics. So for a vehicle this size, this is probably actually worth doing. Let's go ahead and add one of these in. Uh, we're just going to stick this, I've got a little AI cluster back here, uh, and we can go ahead and add this in. And you can see that it, we can dictate how much power this thing should be allowed to use. Right now it's using a ton. It's using 10,000 power. And that means that at, uh, at 5,000 meters, we get 45% uh, sensor accuracy. That's a 55% reduction. Up to at 500 meters, our target will have 28% sensor accuracy. So uh, we could probably, if I were to reduce this, let's go down to say 5,000. That'll give us plenty of power to use for other things on the ship. And those ring shields will consume another chunk. The laser will consume another chunk. Our propulsion, of course, uses uh, yet more power. And between all of this, we end up with a fairly substantial reduction to general purpose or to uh, detection accuracy. Just be warned, you might need to add some more general purpose processing power in order to make this work. Uh, we can add a couple more cards here, 
just to make sure that we have plenty. Uh, this particular vehicle is quite expensive. The cost of these is not negligible. There are 100 materials a piece, but a few of them is not going to break the bank compared to this vehicle's nearly 315,000 materials. So, yeah. Um, this is pretty much the last line of defense attempting to scramble enemy sensors. It's not perfect, but it'll do something, and every little bit helps. Really, when you get right down to it, that's the motto of this episode. Every little bit helps. You want to make sure that you're trying to do every single different mechanism that you possibly can fit onto your vehicle in order to keep your vehicle safe from fire. Every bit of damage that you can reduce is a chance that a critical component or weapon system will not be destroyed, which means that you'll keep fighting better for longer. And really, when you get right down to it, that's what vehicles are meant to do. So that's all for today. Hope you've enjoyed watching. Hope you've learned something, and I hope I'll see you next time.